From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Our conversations with the 2022 Rhode Island gubernatorial candidates continue this week. Helena Folks, the former CBS executive, announced her run in October in an online video. This will be Folks' first run for office, and she's aiming high, joining an already crowded field in the Democratic primary. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi and our guest this week, Helena Folks, Democratic candidate for governor. It's good to have you on the I'm show. so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. In 60 seconds or less, why do you want to be governor? Well, you know, I grew up here. I love this state. I never thought about running for politics before, but COVID changed everything for me. I looked at what's happening to women in particular, communities of color, and I think in the last year we've really stalled out. So I'm running because I want to jumpstart this economy. I really think I can make a difference. I created tens of thousands of jobs at CVS. I know how to bring people together and make things happen. I also grew up in a family that really cared about community involvement. So it's always been part of my DNA. And at CVS, I started right out of school. I had lots of different jobs. But along the way, I had four and a half, I had four kids in four and a half years. Uh, I got cancer when my youngest was just one. So I also really understand what it's like to have a lot of pressure on you personally. Uh, I understand what it's like to feel the importance of health care, a safe job. And so I'm fighting for all Rhode Islanders so that they have the potential to live up to their dreams. And I really think about myself as someone who's a problem solver, someone who knows how to jumpstart the economy and get it working for everyone. You know, as I said at the top of the show, you've never run for... Uh, office before. This will be your first run at elected office. Why do you think governor is an entry-level position? Well, I think of this as an opportunity to get things moving again. And I see myself as really different than everyone else in the race because I've never been a politician. And I don't think that you need to have had political office to understand how to move an economy forward, how to make things work. And so I really bring, I think, a lot of skills to the party, but I care deeply about the state. And I think that I will do something very unique for the people of Rhode Island because I haven't been a politician my whole life. When did you first, when did it first cross your mind? You said, I mean, you were, you were still leading Hudson's Bay Company until I think early in the pandemic, right? Or around that time? Uh, so just before the just pandemic. Just before the pandemic. Yep. So when did, when yeah. did it cross your mind to actually, maybe you'd fleetingly thought of it, but to say, maybe I'll actually run for governor. Really just the beginning of this year. I, I, I was never thinking about it. I, had, I was focused on um, my career, but it was really in the last year that I saw stalling out. And I thought to myself, you know, we need to get this economy moving again. And I did not think that uh, the, co- the current governor knew how to do that, knew how to move us forward. And so that was really the moment I started thinking about things. And we're going to ask you more about your distinctions with the, the incumbent, but sure. I have to ask you about nothing. You've been repeatedly dubbed Gina 2.0 by uh, pundits, critics at times, uh, since it emerged you might run. You've hired multiple former Raimondo staffers. You are friends with Secretary Raimondo, and you've known her for a long time. Mm-hmm. When you hear that, people calling you Gina 2.0, do you find it complimentary, annoying, f- insulting, fair? Like, how do you react to that? You know, I don't think most Rhode Islanders care about that. I, I, if anything, I think of it as Rhode Island 2.0. Uh, I think r- what Rhode Islanders really care about is where are we going? What's our future look like? Look, I think that Governor Raimondo did a very nice job, so I don't mind it at some level, but I really think that the focus should be on what could we do for the next decade for all Rhode Islanders. Are there any differences that you'd point to between the two of you as that comparison comes up over and over? I think it's unnecessary just to compare us. I think we should be looking at how do I compare to everyone in this race? What do I bring to the party that's very unique? And I think what I bring is a, a, an ability to manage a very large organization. I ran a business where we did $80 billion in sales. I had 200,000 people working for me. And I only think the reason that matters to Rhode Islanders is Uh, We have to really rebuild the trust in our government. We've got to make sure that everything we're doing with all these federal funds coming in is focused on how do we serve Rhode Islanders, how do we hold ourselves accountable, and make sure we're doing the right thing every day. Let's talk about the pandemic and COVID. On Thursday, new coronavirus cases topped 900 in Rhode Island uh, for the first time since January. We're taping this program on a Friday morning. Your campaign this morning took aim at Governor Dan McKee and the rising COVID cases saying he is more afraid of criticism than taking action. What is he not doing right now that you would be doing if you were governor? Yeah, 
the the main thing I would be doing if I were governor is I would be listening to the scientists, and I think we've got to. You don't think steady. Governor McKee's listening to scientists? I I don't believe that he has a steady focus on what the scientists are saying because I think it's we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's not that complicated. Uh, we know what needs to happen, and mostly what we've got to focus on is how do we keep people safe, how do we keep the economy moving, and how do we make sure that our kids stay in school. So what does that mean? You, you say we know what we need to do. What, what does that well, translate? Does that mean a sure. mask mandate? Something very simple as uh, a vaccine mandate for all state workers. So this is something that both Connecticut and Massachusetts have had. The governor came out in proponent of it early on, and then he waffled when he got criticism. So to me, that's a very simple thing. Mask mandates when we have a surge are necessary indoors. So that's something I would Are we in that position now? If you were governor, would you pull that trigger? I would ask the scientists if that's the case. I think we're getting very close to that case. Uh, and, and, and so there are going to be people simple. listening who don't like that idea one bit. They are tired of masks and they oh, say, are we going to be in COVID forever? We're all tired of it. I'm tired of it. I, I had Thanksgiving and my aunt, who's 85 years old, said to me, gosh, Helena, do you think we could go one day without talking about COVID? And I know we would all love that. But what we do need to do is make sure that we keep the economy moving, we keep schools open. So my focus is on that. I, I think that the particular tactics are things that we already know about. So let's use them. Let's use them to our advantage and stay strong. Go ahead, Ted. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you about another federal COVID uh, matter, which is you earlier in the week called for an audit of mm -hmm. state federal mm -hmm. COVID relief spending so far. And as I believe the last I saw it was nearly $7 billion has come into the state between the CARES Act and the, and, uh, the ARPA bill and everything else. But, you know, a, a lot of the CARES Act money was spent by Governor Raimondo, not Governor McKee. So, you know, are you, do you have concerns about both administrations or is this just about politics as you're running against the incumbent? I would do a full audit of every dollar we've gotten in. I think this is what Rhode Islanders should care about. This isn't about politics. This is about making sure that all this money is serving Rhode Islanders. You know, in particular this week, I was very worried and concerned about $24 million just showing up suddenly. How do you lose $24 million? And I look at, uh, for example, homelessness. We got $200 million from the federal government. The last we all heard, $150 million has has not been spent by Governor McKee. So let's just have a full audit. And, you know, when I ran a big company, uh, what I knew is how to put really smart people around the room, look at the key metrics, and hold ourselves accountable for the results. That's all I think anyone in the state can ask for. I don't think it's that hard, and I think we owe it to ourselves to do that. The state has this much discussed $1.1 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act, which has relatively few strings attached, so there's a lot of flexibility around where to invest that money. It is one-time money. Let's talk about what you are for. What do you think sure. is the biggest priority for that one-time large infusion of federal funds? Yeah. I think the most important thing we can do right now is jumpstart the economy. So I would put everything through a lens of how are we building our economy for the next decade. Uh, the second thing I would focus on is investing in our kids. We have uh, big opportunities, whether it's from early childhood, child care to universal pre-K to K through 12 education, free college, workforce development, investing in our kids and making sure they're as strong as they can be. And then affordability is a big issue for Rhode Islanders. You look at the cost of prescription drugs, you look at housing, childcare, energy. Those are all things that I think really matter to Rhode Islanders. And if you go back to the economy, we, we have a climate challenge as well. And so we can use this climate challenge to be both, uh, it, it is certainly a threat, but we can think about building a green economy, both blue and green. So I would all be about focused on growing jobs and jump-starting the economy. We may return to the topic of, of COVID, but I do want to pivot to some policy questions. Voters and people sure. of Rhode Island really don't know you uh, sure. yet. Uh, so I'm going to hit you up on a, a couple of quick ones here. Do you support or oppose raising the income tax on wealthy Rhode Islanders? Mm, I think the most important, I, I should start by saying, because I know you guys are going to hit me with a bunch of questions. I'm still figuring a lot of things out. And so I don't have a 17 point plan. And I think I'm different than other politicians in that sense. A big part of what I'm doing is I'm meeting with people across the state is I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening and I'm learning. But in particular, what I would say is I think the most important thing we can do is make sure that we have a robust economy and we've got a great tax base. So I would be focused on what are the smart things we can do to attract more people and businesses to the state. I don't know yet exactly what that means, but I don't start from a place where I think we should immediately tax the rich more. 
I actually focus on a place where I wonder about whether we could raise revenues by attracting more people here. So uh, there was a, a union-backed proposal to raise the income tax from just below 6% to just below 9% uh, on those making above $475,000. It sounds like you would um, be a little cool to that idea right, as it stands right now. Yeah, in general, what I would say right now is I'm open to a lot of ideas. I always am. I want to hear different perspectives. But in general, I don't think we should make ourselves less attractive for people to live and work in Rhode Island. Do you support or oppose legalized recreational marijuana? I do support the, the, the uh, legalization of marijuana. I think it's something that is, um, we need to really continue studying the health impacts of marijuana. We don't know the long-term impacts, but I think there's a competitive issue here where the states right around us are doing it. It's a big revenue opportunity. I think we should seize that. And the last thing I would say is I think this, was an, this is an equity issue. So there are far too many uh, people of color in jail who are in there um, and, and shouldn't be. So I think this is another reason that we should be looking at this particular issue. Just real quick on that, uh, before we go back to Ted here, is you know, a lot of people might wonder how you square that with, uh, while you were at CVS as an executive there, yeah. they got rid of, uh, the company got rid yeah. of tobacco products and you just raised you know, health and uh, concerns. How yeah. do you square those two things? Yeah, it's, it's complicated. Look, I'm really proud of what I did at CVS. So for 20 years, we had been, uh, asking ourselves if we should stop selling cigarettes. You know, we're a, a, a company that, uh, when I was there, we were focused on uh, helping people with their health care. And uh, at the end of the day, I was able to pull people together and make a really hard decision. And we had a measurable impact on smoking rates in this country. So that was something that I was very proud of. Everyone in the company was proud of. And this is another area we don't know enough about. So I, I don't go into this thinking about it glibly. I think, as I said at the beginning, we need to study it and understand it. But there's a competitive issue here, too. You told uh, Ian Donis, our friend at the Public's Radio, in an interview yesterday, uh, you support the Lifespan Care New England Hospital merger with appropriate guardrails. I've covered those two organizations a long time, and it is still somewhat hard for me to imagine how a organization with $4 billion in annual revenue, dominating Rhode Island health care, plenty of statehouse lobbyists, what mechanism there would be that would really uh, you know, sort of hold down uh, Gulliver like people are talking about here. What do you yeah. envision, especially someone who's, who's been in a large company and mm -hmm. has thought about healthcare, mm -hmm. what do you think concretely could be done that wouldn't just mean they'll, they're going to say whatever everyone wants them to say to get the merger through, but would actually have a long-term impact to keep yeah. costs down for people? Yeah, well, look, I, I, I think that in a state of our size with 1.1 million people, we really do have an opportunity to reimagine healthcare. It's the largest sector in our state right now. Uh, but I think what we've learned through COVID, it's not serving everyone. It's not serving people in all communities. If you look at people of color, again, there are a lot of maternal health issues that are not being addressed. So I start fundamentally with a patient-centered approach around this hospital merger. And I think what we should start with, and I always use this in my business career, I always started from a place of what could go right? You know, how could we reimagine this hospital system to really serve people differently? And so I think when you start from a place of that and you imagine what it could do for Rhode Islanders uh, and you believe that it really could fundamentally produce better outcomes at a lower cost, have more people in the community serving people, then ultimately the way you put those guardrails together, um, we can all figure out. You know, what are the critical metrics? Every business that I've ever been involved in, you have critical measures that you're looking at. We're transparent with them. We hold ourselves accountable. But so you I think fundament that's a, a, you fundamentally believe that there is a way that state government could would could kind of sort of rein in that organization if necessary? I do. I do. And I know we've lost a lot of faith and confidence in our state government. And I think that I, I would like to restore that level of trust, and I really do think we could do that. All right, we're going to take a break on the program. When we come back, our conversation with Helena Folks, Democratic candidate for governor, will continue. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Helena Folks, Democratic candidate for Rhode Island governor. I want to turn, return uh, to your years at CVS. You were an executive there, leaving as president of CVS Pharmacy. A federal grand jury in Ohio found three of the nation's largest pharmacies, including CVS, had substantially contributed to the crisis of opioid overdoses and deaths. Now, you told Ian Donis at the Public's Radio that you were angry because Purdue Pharma lied to CVS and to others. But look, prosecutors argued that pharmacies 
had turned a blind eye to countless red flags and a jury agreed. Why are they wrong? Yeah, I, I really want to start by saying that I think this is absolutely devastating for families. Um, I, I think we can forget all this with lawsuits and everything going on, but the crisis has only gotten worse in COVID. Mental health issues, addiction issues are really devastating. So that, my, my heart really breaks, and this was a, a, a terrible episode in America's health history because of what Purdue Pharma did do. And uh, I, I, I just want to explain a little bit, you know, if you, if you can imagine, I, I was serving pharmacists, we were all trying to help them on the front line, and they were serving people who were coming in with valid prescriptions and it was very hard for them. And we all missed it, by the way, right? Not every player in the system was duped by Purdue Pharma. So that makes me angry. But what, what, I, what I do feel proud of, if, if you could say that, is we did move as quickly as we could. I'm particularly proud of what I did to bring industry players together, other leaders of other drugstore chains, so that we could really push on legislation because no one could do this alone. We needed to be able to, for example, make sure that when people left basic dental surgery, that they had fewer pills in their bottle. Because two thirds of kids who get hit, hooked on opioids started in their parents' medicine cabinets. So this has been a problem that's been really per pervasive. And I, um, I do think I'd be a better governor because I know what these issues look like and I know how to serve people and all the complexity of an issue like yeah, this. Yeah, I appreciate all that, but I do wonder if people are gonna hear your answer and think you might be trying to reframe the issue and make CBS almost as a victim in this when clearly a federal grand, a federal jury did not does not agree with that assessment. Yeah, look, I, I'm not a CBS spokesperson. I haven't worked there in four years, but I, I but would you did just for say 25. that when, when I was working there, as soon as we saw things that were going on, we jumped on this. Uh, one of the issues that we worked on, for example, were pill mills. There were doctors out there in, in who were not real doctors who were writing what looked like valid prescriptions. And as soon as we saw that, we cut off, we cut off thousands of doctors from being able to write prescriptions at CVS. So there were a lot of things going on. It was a really complicated time. It was hard to see the data across all of our stores. And I think it did take all of us too long. I will not say it didn't, but I do believe that as soon as we saw it, we jumped into action. You uh, donated mostly to Democrats during your career. Um, you know a question is coming, but in 2014, mm -hmm. you gave $500 to Republican Mitch McConnell. Um, and when you were first asked about this, um, I heard from multiple Democrats who were somewhat aghast at your initial explanation, because as they heard it, you were saying, well, in 2014, I didn't realize there was anything wrong with him yet, because he hadn't done the Supreme Court thing, whereas he'd already been obstructing o President Obama in their eyes for, for six years. You know, you, can you admit that you, you had to do that for, for corporate reasons, seemingly, and it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was kind of pay to play, it appears to people. Like, you had to give $500 so that CVS would be heard in the Republican halls of power. Yeah, look, at that time, we were working really hard to make sure that the Affordable Care Act stood together, and we had to work with people both who were Democrats and Republicans. So uh, that was part of an effort to make sure that we were working both sides of the aisle, make it very clear there is nothing about Mitch McConnell that I support or like or trust. So uh, in that sense, I really do regret it. But I think it came from a place of making sure that we were working with both sides of the aisle. On, also on you know, CVS and political money, you uh, were a regular donor to the company's political action committee. Mm -hmm. And during your final years at CVS, the company became a major contributor to President Trump's reelection campaign. Mm -hmm. Were you in any way involved in decisions about the allocation of the PAC money, where the money went out to as an executive? Absolutely not. So you just donated and then it was up to someone else at CVS yeah. to decide where? Mm -hmm. Were you unhappy when you heard a lot of your money had been directed over to President Trump? I think. President Trump was really devastating uh, for this country, so I certainly would never have donated personally to him, but I gave money to our PAC because, again, we needed to be able to work with people on both sides of the aisle. That's, that's how it was. Let's zoom back into Rhode Island and education. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bill before the legislature in the last session that would have put a moratorium on the expansion of charter schools. It failed in the House, but it could be back, and if you were governor and it reached your desk, would you sign it or veto it? I fundamentally believe that we've got to do everything we can in this state to serve our kids. And if that means uh, charter schools are part of it, then I would include charter schools in the mix. Not every charter school is alike. 
Uh, some of them are fantastic and some of them aren't, aren't uh, hitting what they should do. But I think we really need to go back to uh, the outcomes that we're producing for our kids. So if you look across the state today, only 33% of our kids are at reading level and 20% at math level. So 80% of our kids are failing math. This is not okay. I'd be doing everything I could in my power to help get, get us out of this rut. It's, it's a moral issue for our kids. It's also an economic issue. It's making sure that our businesses have workers who can be successful in their life. So I think it's a really critical issue. And if charter schools is part of that solution, then I'd be open to that. And just another quick question on education specific to Providence. As you know, the state has taken over the troubled Providence public schools. There have been some calls to return that power, that control, I should say, back to the city. What's your assessment on that? Do you think it's working or should the city take it back? Yeah, this is just a, a, a devastating situation for the family. So if you look again, uh, some scores that matter. In Providence, 93% of our kids are failing at math. Uh, and so this is not acceptable. And um, I think we were all hopeful when the state took over that a lot would change. And so far, it doesn't look like it's producing results. I'd like to dig into them more to understand what's happened. Uh, we did do this right at the beginning of COVID, mm -hmm. so it's been complex. I've not had a chance to meet uh, any of the important leaders around this in particular. But the way that I would approach this is the way I've approached every business issue I've ever had, which is let's pull all the people together, let's listen to everything, let's make the hard decisions, and then hold ourselves accountable to the key metrics that matter. I think we lost sight of that here. You know, I started to look at some of the data that is out there that's been presented to the Senate. There are reams and reams of data, but there's not a simple metric uh, and snapshot uh, on a frequent enough basis for us to know how we're doing. And that's what I think these kids and parents deserve. Um, you mentioned earlier, when you're talking about the three focuses you would have as governor, you mentioned yeah. the cost of living in Rhode Island. You said affordability. Yeah. and. You know, we often hear politicians talk about affordability. People want, are worried about the cost of living, but then it becomes actually very hard to move the needle with legislation, or you find there's a reason that's expensive. There's interest groups that want that to be expensive for right. different reasons, like with the cost of energy. So can you point to anything concrete you're thinking about that would actually have a measurable impact on lowering the bills average Rhode Island families are paying? Yeah, it's a really good question. And 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 I think that, you know, it's... it's um, a problem when Rhode Islanders are being sort of priced out of our own state. So one of the things I'm excited about on around child care is the federal legislation. Um, and, and I think the opportunity we have in this state right now at this moment is to make sure that as all these federal dollars are coming in, we're spending them as wisely as we can. So around child care in particular, um, we have a supply issue as well. So if we can cap uh, families spend at 7% of their income, which is what the federal government would do. I think that's a huge opportunity for Rhode Island families. I'd be looking at, do we have enough uh, child care providers? What more could we do to move that along? So I don't have all the answers yet, um, but I do think that with a focus on what matters to Rhode Island families, we can really figure out what are the needles we can move. When I was at CBS, one of the things that we did is we did something very innovative um, around insulin and we brought down the price of insulin in a dramatic fashion in terms of finding a provider that just hadn't been out in the marketplace and being able to strike a relationship with them, which is still in place today. So there are innovative things that I don't have all the answers on, but I'd wanna pull people together and make sure we're looking at that. As I said, we'd pivot back to, to uh, COVID. You have criticized Governor McKee for giving state workers a $3,000 bonus for getting vaccinated. What's your issue with it? Well, look, I, 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 I think we all are so grateful to these state workers for what they did during COVID, right? They showed up every single day and they were taking care of all of us. So I want all of them to be fairly compensated. And, and, and I appreciate that. I think my issue with this is paying a $3,000 bonus for getting a vaccine doesn't feel right to most people in this state. We, we have great vaccination rates. We're at 83% of everyone over the age of 12. And so I don't understand why we would pay people to do something that most of us have already done. Um, and I believe that there should be a mandate on vaccine for state workers. This is something Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut have both done. So for me, I would fundamentally look at this problem a little differently. And I'd say, if we had a compensation issue, how do we deal with compensation the right way? And then how do we look at other barriers that these workers had as they got their shots? So whether it was transportation, childcare, paid time off, all of these are issues that I would be focused on. 
And the last thing I would say is, for me, this gets back to trust in government. You know, all of this was very unclear to all of us as taxpayers as the, gov as the governor was negotiating this contract. I would have liked for all of us to have seen it so we could understand what was in there. And, and that just wasn't an option. So I, I, I believe that there's a big opportunity to build trust in government. We have um, about 30 seconds left in the program here. Uh, will you commit to debating candidates in the primary here on Channel 12? I can't wait to debate. Yes. <laughs> I, I like that answer. Yeah. All right, actually 20 seconds left. Best holiday movie. Oh, my best holiday movie. Uh, my goodness, I'd have to say. Um, Last night I it's was the toughest question you faced all Annie. day. <laughs> yeah, I guess Annie. I was watching Annie last night. It was the sort answer of fun. is Elf. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, I failed this one. My final question. <laughs> Helena, folks, a candidate for governor. Thank you for joining thank us you for so Ted Nisi. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.